Can you guys hear me? Yes. Good. I have to use my outside voice. <laughs> Please. <laughs> my outside voice. Well, you better watch out. I might break into Colin Cadence or something. I don't know, you know. Start <laughs> army talking. Or, I better not do that. That's bad. <laughs> All those words and phrases are still locked away in my brain somewhere. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, how are we doing today? Good. Good. We're doing pretty good, hopefully, yes. or at least at least okay, right? Yep. You have to say fine. I know you're not. <coughs> okay. Well, didn't renew, I didn't re, I didn't review my notes this morning. I should have because I typed them yesterday and I forgot what I typed already. So. <laughs> Anybody, has that happened to anybody else? No. Yeah, walk outside and like, <laughs> what would I come out here to do? It takes me five trips to the garage to get what I need to do one thing in the house, you know. So. Forget what I go out to get a screwdriver and come back with a hammer and it's like, whoops. And like, <laughs> yeah, you, you chuckle now. You wait another yeah. 20 some years. You'll find out. You'll find out. It takes longer to do everything. Alrighty. Okay. Well, I got a question for you. I like to start with questions, so um, I'm going to ask you a question that might be personal. So I'm not expecting an answer. At least not a verbal answer. I want you to answer inside your head. I'll wait till the car goes by. That's the problem with being outside service right next to the road. It's just traffic noise, right? I think what we should do is one of you should go on each end of the road and block the road off and make people go around. Yes. <laughs> I've got four little traffic cones at the house that are about that tall. That might help you. Make okay. people be speed bumps lay in the middle of the road. Yeah, it'll stand in the middle of the road. You'll probably handle it. All right, question. Is there a difference for us? Is there a difference for you? And is there a difference for me personally between someone saying, I'll pray for you? Or perhaps the common social media response of prayers, right? With the little praying hands, right? The little emojis. Is there a difference between that? versus someone actually praying with you in the moment. Is there a difference? Boy, it sure feels like it, doesn't it? Right? So, I tried to learn this from a previous pastor mentor of mine. He, I, I never heard him say, I will pray for you. I would hear him say, he would grab people by the hand if, if he was in close proximity to them. Of course, this was pre-COVID days. He would grab people by the hand and says, let's pray about that right now. It didn't matter where he was. Middle of a restaurant, sidewalk, right? Church parking lot. Buy Mart, if you had a Buy Mart, right? That's how, that's how Pastor Larry uh, taught me. And sometimes I remember to do that. And there is a difference. I think there's a huge difference because a lot of times when we say, I'll pray for you, we don't do it. At least I'm that way. I forget. If I don't write it down, I forget. Or if I, you know, respond on Facebook with a couple little, the little praying hand thing and say prayers, do I actually remember to, sit, to stop right there and pray for that person right then and there? Sadly, a lot of times the answer is no for me. However, if I say, can I pray with you right now? I've never had anybody say no. So, yes, there is a difference. Jesus does not say, I'll pray for you. Paul doesn't even say, I'll pray for you. Paul says, I remember you in my prayers. But he never puts it off as a future thing, I'll pray for you. Because when you say, I'll pray for you, well, when is that? When are you going to do that? Yeah, next year? <laughs> when it suddenly comes back and uh, you suddenly remember, oh yeah, I was going to pray for that guy six months ago. Right? No. Jesus doesn't say, I'll pray for you. He just does it. We see that, of course, in John chapter 17. And today we're going to look at John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26, as we finish our way through the 17th chapter of John. So if you haven't been here uh, to set the setting for John 17... The Last Supper has already occurred. Judas Iscariot is all, has already uh, scampered off to go make it to seal his deal 
with the Sanhedrin and deliver Jesus to them for 30 pieces of silver. That's already happened. Jesus has been telling of the 11 remaining disciples that bad things are coming. I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to get executed. You're all going to run away. And then in John chapter 17, he prays for the disciples. He pray, we'll start, he first prays for himself. So we get five whole verses, we get one paragraph of prayer where he prays for himself. And really he's praying, praying that God will be glorified through what's going to occur. Then he prays for the 11 remaining disciples, and indirectly for us. But then in the, in the end of the chapter, he prays directly for all people who will believe throughout history. So let's uh, turn your Bibles if you got them. If you don't, you should bring a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, but you have a smartphone, you know you can get free Bible apps on your smartphones. Put in pretty much any translation you want to pick in any language. So, No excuse for not having a Bible now in the 21st century. John chapter 17, starting at verse 20. I do not pray for these alone. So he's referring back to the 11, remaining, the 11 disciples. Okay. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. It's John 17, 20 through 26. So we're just going to break this down through the, the end of this prayer and see the application it has for us. First off, we believe because of the Apostle's word. The second half of verse 20 says, Believe in me through their word. The word of the apostles is known as what? The, gospel. the New Testament, right? The gospel. Matthew was one of the one of the disciples. Mark was a very good friend of Peter, one of the disciples. Luke, who is a a non-Jewish uh, physician, was the traveling companion of Paul. Was his personal doctor. John, one of the disciples. Peter, one of the disciples. So, those men, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote down the history of what happened and developed Christian doctrine that we teach even today. So we believe because of the Apostles' word the New Testament. It's this word that unites believers throughout history. I'm not talking ecumenically as in, well, we have to be exactly united with the Roman Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church or the Methodist Church or the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Baptist Church or, you know, etc., etc., right? I'm not talking about denominational union, unity. I'm talking about the unity through the Holy Spirit. We are, we are united through the Spirit, through His Word. Does anybody here um, have the guts to quote 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? Are we all shy? Or do we all have poor memories? Maybe we should do a sword drill. For all, all Scripture is God-breathed or given by inspiration of God, right? Depending on your translation. And is useful... For what? Doctrine. Doctrine, which is teaching. Okay. Doctrine is not a scary word. It's just teaching. Doctrine. Go ahead. Reproof. 
Reproof, that's kind of a scary word. Correction. Correction. And instruction in righteousness. Yeah, and instruction in righteousness. So that, what? What is it useful for? Thoroughly equipped. So the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, or the woman of God, for every good work. Okay? So we are united with Christians all around the world. Not just people who go to a, a church served by a village missionary, which I am a village missionary, and I can tell you more about that later if you don't know what it is. Okay? We are united with, with Christians who go to a church that has a different name attached to it. We are united by the Word of God through His Spirit. She must have thought church still starts at 11. <laughs> We've been fooling people by not following the sign out there. That's okay. We'll change back eventually. We are united with Christians throughout history. Regardless of which name you put in front of it, right? We're, I, I'm here to tell you, we're even united with some Roman Catholics. I once heard a priest say at a Roman Catholic funeral that I attended, and, he, and I think he was serious. It was a little funny. He was serious. But he said, not all Catholics are going to hell. As a priest said that. All right? I have a very good friend of mine in this town who is a very devout Roman Catholic. He's also a very strong Christian brother. And he and I are very close. That doesn't mean I'm going Catholic. Don't worry about it. Okay? I'm not. We are united across denominations, not by an ecumenical movement. We are united by the Spirit of God. And Jesus' prayer is for us to be one. And one means what? One means singular, right? But what else does it mean? Unity. Unity. This isn't in my sermon notes, but these two are about to get married in three weeks. Right? What does God's Word say about marriage? Why do we have marriage? The two become one flesh and therefore become one unit or almost one person. Now, I've been married to my wife for 30... 32 years, thank you. I knew what it was. I'm just messing with everybody. Okay. <laughs> now, I cannot always read her mind. She can usually read mine. I cannot always read her mind. But we have the ability to complete each other's sentences. We have the ability to say the exact same thing at the exact same time. Sometimes. Sometimes. Quite frequently. Right? I've been married for 54, so I understand. Okay. <laughs> All right. We are united. That's what one means to be united together just as as Jesus says in this passage he and the father are one mm -hmm. so he wants Christians to be united together in spirit just as he is united with the father in spirit isn't that something so this is not a Pentecostal church you will not see me you know doing cartwheels down the aisle <laughs> okay, and sh and jumping up and down and God, pooping and hollering. That. That's not my style. Okay, Boy, I was honey. raised to be pretty stoic. <laughs> we'll see you later. And that's okay. <laughs> you, but you know what? Man. <laughs> it's okay that we have a couple Pentecostal churches in town where they might do cartwheels down the aisle. I mean, I'm not going to say exactly what they do. I'm just throwing that out. There, okay, it's okay that they get excited. It's all right. It's just not my style. Okay. It's not, we're, you know, this is a group of um, Stoics right here, right? <laughs> you know, people think we're frowning, and really we say, what do we say? Oh, we're smiling on the inside. <laughs> Don't you ever smile? Oh, I'm smiling on the inside. <laughs> My old work partner used to say that. He frowned all the time. Like, Eric, don't you ever smile? I'm smiling on the inside. <laughs> I used to smile all the time, and then people file complaints. <laughs> It's a true story. <laughs> My partner Eric never smiled at work, and he never got demeanor complaints. I would smile and laugh with people, and they <laughs> turn you in. Exactly, turn you in. I'm not coming here again. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> okay. So Jesus' prayer is for us to be 
<laughs> united in spirit, right? Just as He and the Father are, and Jesus' Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is in us. So we therefore are also united, not just with fellow believers, we are united with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit spiritually. We are one. At least we're supposed to be. That, and God loves us as He loves the Son. And how, how does the world recognize the love of God? Where, where should they see it? They should see it right here, right? And they should see it in the other churches, that the Christian churches that are meeting on Sunday, if they can, or on Saturday, if they're a Saturday church. The love of God is not something that's just, you know, it's not like it's hanging on a tree to be looked at. We can see the majesty, we can see the power of God in a tree and its creation and how it works. But the love of God is seen in people and through people. That's where it's supposed to be seen. So if you're a Christian, I would hope that a good share of the time when you're outside the house, well inside the house too, but outside the house, that you put on, you, did you have a genuine smile? All right? Now there's a difference between a genuine smile and a fake smile. This is a fake smile. <laughs> It's like somebody from South Carolina saying, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what they really mean. <laughs> See, I right? thought that was nice. <laughs> it is nice. I don't know, do we, do we have any phrases like that in Central Oregon, you know, to, to indicate that, man, are you a dope, but don't come across that way. Is that good or bad? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Do we, we, we need to invent one and get it spread around Central Oregon. I don't know. <laughs> South Carolina's got it figured out. Okay. A genuine smile. Yeah, you know what? Bad things happen to us, and there's, there's going to be days where we ain't going to smile. Right? We have tragedy in our community, don't we? We have tragedy in our families at times. And sometimes it comes in twos and threes. So it gets sometimes it gets difficult to smile, and that's okay. You don't have to smile all the time, and you don't have to put on a fake smile. I would rather, I would rather when I come to see you, if you are in a bad way that day, that you just let me know. It's easier not to step on your toes if we know what you're really feeling emotionally, right? I mean, some of us wear our emotions on our sleeves, and some of us hide them. I think it's healthier for you if you just wear them on your sleeve once in a while. It's okay to be a little vulnerable. All right. But the world is supposed to recognize... Let me get back on track now. The world is supposed to recognize Jesus through us. There's two places the world is going to find Jesus. One is in His written Word. And there's plenty of people out there that have just picked up a Bible that maybe it was in a hotel room or in their hospital room. You can still get those in a hospital room. I don't know. You know, Gideon's Bible, that kind of thing. Plenty of people who have just picked up a Bible, started reading it, and come to believe. But I think there's a whole lot more people that came to believe through a relationship with a believer. The love of Jesus Christ, the world should recognize Jesus in us. Jesus also prays. All right, so the first prayer was for us to be one, united with the Father as He is with the Father, united with the Spirit, and that the world would recognize Him through us. The second part of His prayer is that he makes a particular desire known to the Father. The desire is not for him personally. The desire is not for him to not go to the cross, right? That desire is for him to not be, you know, whipped and beaten and spit on and all that kind of stuff and made fun of. No. His desire is that we will be in his glorious presence where he is. 
And that is not here. His desire will be in heaven with him someday. He wants us with him for eternity. Why? Why does he... Okay, well, I heard it over there. Say it loud. Because he loves us. Oh, because he loves us. Remember when he was talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus the Pharisee, the religious leader who just... Even though he had it all in front of him, he had all those, what we would call the Old Testament, all the prophecies, all the scriptures, all the Psalms that point, the whole thing from the first words of Genesis point to Jesus. And they didn't see it. Jesus told him he had to be born again. And of course he's thinking, you know, medical, physical terms, right? How can a man be born again? How can he go back to his mother's womb, right? And then we get to probably the most known memory verse in the Bible. John 3.16 comes out of that conversation. What is that? For God so loved the world that it is the only begotten Son should not perish but have eternal life. Okay, we just said that in like five different translations. <laughs> That was almost Pentecostal, like we're speaking in tongues. Okay. I mean, I I memorized this as a you know as a little kid at vacation Bible school in King James because that's what everybody did then, you know. And now I have new King James, but I've also memorized it in NIV, and I get them all mixed up. So, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. This is New King James, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's verse 17. We always forget to memorize that one, right? So let's keep reading as we conclude today's message and do, then do our communion service. This is still John chapter 3. Now we're at verse 18. He who believes in Him is not condemned, and he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does come, excuse me, but he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. All right, there's your gospel in a nutshell, right? Now I'm going to get fire and brimstone on you just for just a second. We have an eternal choice to make that we have to make before eternity comes upon us. So we have an eternal choice to make in our mortal lives. Mortal means there's an end to it, doesn't it? We have an eternal choice to make. We either believe or we do not. We either believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He lived a sinless life, which we can't do, that He died as the ultimate final sacrifice, the propitiation, as it were, the satisfaction. Did the camera just turn off? No, it's still on. Still on? Okay. It was a phone. Oh, okay. It makes the same tone. <laughs> All right. We either believe that, we, we believe that he died, we believe that he was buried for three days, and we believe that he rose again immortal, or we do not. There is no fence-sitting middle ground like, well, you know, I'll wait till I'm dead and then I'll figure it out. <laughs> it's too late at that point. Okay? If you sit on this fence, it's an electric fence, and it's going to zap you, you know where. I've had that happen, okay? So I don't recommend that at all. That hurts. There's no fence setting. Verse 18 says, He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. That means before you believe, you're condemned already. But when you believe, the condemnation is taken away. That means the sentence of eternal punishment is removed. It's erased. A 
And this is the condemnation, verse 19, that the light, Jesus Christ, is the light. He calls himself the light of the world, right? That the light has come into the world, and men, that's men and women, boys and girls, us, we love darkness more than light. We like our sinful little secrets, don't we? We all have them. Or have them. People don't want to give that up. It's kind of like when when somebody gets caught with their hand in the cookie jar, so to speak. I'm using that as a figure of speech. When they get caught with their hand in the cookie jar, what do they do? Oh, they make more noise and blame everybody else around them. <laughs> right? Why? Because they have been exposed. So, there's a little lesson for you. Beware of the people who make the most noise about everybody else. Beware of the people who are pointing the fingers at everybody else. You know the you know the the little analogy if you point if you point a finger you got three pointing back. That's why I point with my knife hand. <laughs> All right. When you start pointing fingers at when you start judging everybody else, what are you really doing? Well, you're really hiding the things you're doing, right? Deflecting attention, right? Because we don't want our deeds exposed. But when we seek the truth, we come to the light. No way. We come to the light of Jesus Christ. And when we do what is right, even when it's not popular, when we do what is right, then those things can be clearly seen, can't they? That they have been done in God. Love you, guys. Love you too. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> I've talked to them before. Hello. All right. Jesus prays for us to be united. He prays that all believers will be in His presence, in His glory. Look, look at this, the description later in Revelation of the glory of the throne room of heaven in the presence of the Father and the Son. That's where we'll be. Not here. Not in this. We won't have any need for 24 hour off road recovery in heaven. <laughs> You'll never get stuck, right? No flat tires. No crashes. No death. No sense of loss. Nobody doing anything evil to you in His glorious presence where He is in heaven. Let's close the message in prayer and then we'll serve communion uh, COVID-19 stuff. Huh? Oh, after the song. Yeah, we'll do communion after the song. I'm sorry. I'm not looking at my bulletin. Alrighty. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank You for uh, today and I thank You for each one here. We thank You for Your Son, Jesus Christ. He is the light. May we all come to that light, be united together in His Spirit, in Your Spirit, and we look forward to the day when we never have to look at bad news again. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, so we're going to close with a song. I'm going to let Shane come up and do that if he wants. What are we singing? Well, we're, we're going to close this part of the service with a song, Power in the Blood. I think it's all on there. And then we'll do communion. Now i got to step back for you. Just stand if you like. I'm spitting goodness. I won't hack your boob on you. <laughs> we won't force you. When are you ready, Pat?
gluten free. We now have gluten free little communion bread individually wrapped. Oh, really? So that's on the right side. So I will only use my right hand glove in the gluten free tray. Okay? <laughs> the left hand will do the gluten filled stuff and, <laughs> and the cup of juice. All right? So we'll just keep this um, fairly simple today. You guys can sit down. Wait, sit down for a minute. Uh, like stand there. <laughs> Which we have guests here today. <coughs> we go strictly with what the scripture teaches. We don't add anything to what the meaning of this is or what it could be or become when you eat it. We don't do that. Okay? <laughs> it's, not, it's not how we roll here in Lapine. Yeah, Lapine Community Church anyway. Yeah. Um, what, what, what communion is, or the Lord's Supper, is to be a memorial, a remembrance of his death. So the little piece of bread is to be representative of the physical body, the human body of Jesus Christ. And the cup of juice, we use grape juice here just to be safe, is to, is a memorial, a remembrance of the blood that poured out of his body through his torture and his execution. Okay? And of course it goes back to the the meal of the Passover, which goes clear back to the Israelites in Egypt with Moses. And that was given to Moses really as a sign of Jesus Christ. Mm. A, a, a prefiguring, a pre-shadowing of the sacrifice that was to come. In Egypt, they sacrificed a lamb. They painted the blood on the doorposts. Interesting. Kind of like the blood on the cross, right? painted the blood on the doorpost so when the angel of death passed through Egypt it would pass over their family their house and not kill the firstborn in the house but the Egyptians didn't do that they didn't paint the blood and therefore the firstborn died well Jesus is sometimes called the firstborn of God right he's also called the lamb of God so all these things are are just images for us to really ponder and consider as we share in communion bread and the communion cup. So what I'm going to do just to simplify things is we're, going to, we're just going to give thanks for both of those at the same time and then just uh, come on up here and we'll kind of go this way. i got a garbage can over here which we can move out farther if you want. So the folks with the gluten-free bread and the individual packing got some place to drop their little piece of plastic that it was in and there's also a place for you to drop your plastic cup because we're not reusing these. Okay? All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the body and blood of your son Jesus Christ. We remember that today. That he gave himself up for us. So that we could be in his glorious presence in eternity as he prayed for in John chapter 17. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.